Hi, Fight fans. We're here today with Paul the Ultimate Vaden, former IBF junior middleweight champ of the world and currently corporate mentor and motivational speaker. Paul, thanks for taking the time to talk to Fight News and, and tell us about your, your past and present uh, and your future. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, you've got a book out. A lot of people didn't even know about it, including myself, that just came out a couple of years ago. And uh, from some of the reviews I read, it talked about, you know, the traditional beginnings of a boxer, uh, tough inner city upbringing. You, you grew up and have lived in San Diego all your life, is that true? Well, I, I grew up in San Diego. I'm, I'm from San Diego. Um, because of my travels and because of where I wanted to be and where I wanted to go, I mean, becoming champion of the world, um, I had to go to different areas of, of the United States. I, I lived in um, the state of Washington, uh, I lived in the uh, state of Michigan, uh, I lived in the state of Nevada, being Las Vegas. Um, the places I needed to go to get the right tutelage um, to get to that next level and to reach the destiny which of being a champion of the world. So, um, in that, that be, as also being an amateur, being a, an elite amateur uh, boxer, so um, I was willing to make those um, uh, challenges, meet those challenges better yet, and um, go to place. But yes, I am from from San Diego, and it always brought me back to San Diego. Now, um, you know, like I said, we, we hear so many stories about uh, kids that get into boxing from the tough streets, the background, and that's kind of like their, their way out. Um, but you were a guy with, from what I've heard, you know, academic success, you're well-spoken, you have model good looks. I remember the first time I've seen you on television talking in a, a post-fight interview, and I said, basically, you know, put it succinctly, wow, this, this guy is different. This guy is not a typical boxer. So tell me about your upbringing and what I read at four years old. You, you saw Muhammad Ali and were drawn to him and his mystique and his charisma and that's you said that's what you wanted to do and you wanted to be a, a champion so tell me a little bit about you how you got steered that way and, and your your family support and, and what role they played in um, you taking the direction you took um, just as you stated at four years old I would see a man Mr. Muhammad Ali on TV and anytime I would see him I would just totally uh, become something else I would be excited become animated, I would mimic what he was doing, but I was enthralled by what I was seeing. And I really didn't have, at that time, obviously, um, the outlet or the skill to um, portray properly what uh, this great man was doing, but it was doing something to me. And, and when I saw him, um, I knew what I wanted to be, um, and I knew what I wanted to do. And I'm, I was a, a mama's boy, I'm 48, but I'm still a mama's boy. Um, but I wanted to do this, and um, at eight years old, um, I started that path. And, and truthfully, uh, even at the age of four and five, I had an individual um, who lived next door to me who boxed in the Navy, Mr. Cliff Darden, who would sneak me off because he didn't like the fact that I was, I was under my mom's uh, skirt all the time, and she didn't want me to get dirty and stuff, so he would sneak me off and, and teach me proper you know, ways he boxed in the Navy, uh, throwing a jab and um, show me gloves and show me um, the heavy bag that he had in his garage and he would sneak me off. And, and So that was my first introduction. And then at eight years old, I got started at the Jackie Robinson YMCA where an individual by the name of Mr. Robert Coons uh, started my, um, my real journey. And once I got there, I was all in. To, be, to have all these tools and uh, this inventory of things that I always dreamed of, uh, gloves, um, having access to a jump rope, having access to hit a heavy bag, see a speed bag, to dance in the ring, um, I was in heaven. So um, now I had this path um, to glory, path to where I wanted to go and what I wanted to be. So um, that's where it all got started. That's why I got started. It had nothing to do with me being in, in trouble. Yeah, I grew up um, very poor um, and things of that nature, tough neighborhoods and stuff like that. But the reason why I boxed was by the sight of seeing Mr. Muhammad Ali, and it started the path where I wanted to go. And the first bloody nose, the first busted lip, the first shot to the ribs didn't dissuade you, as it uh, does a lot of kids. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I was, when I was 
um, little, like I said, eight years old, I was sparring and stuff like that. I used to be scared to spar, um, <laughs> but um, I always kept coming back. I mean, and, um, and, and nervous to spar, I wouldn't say scared, uh, very nervous to spar and expose myself to people. And interestingly, boxing has been that path to the things that I'm doing now because I, I have no fear of doing it. It's, it's effortless as far as, I mean, it's hard work, but uh, there's, no, there's no fear. I look forward to it. I take it on. So, yeah, there were bloody noses at, at that stage. And, yeah, you, you, you don't know the capacity of what you can do and what you can be. You don't know what the second win is about. You, you're tired. All you know is you're tired. And because you're tired, that means, I guess, you're supposed to stop. Well, that's not true. So, fortunately, I had the proper um, structure, uh, the proper toolage, uh, the individual who taught me to keep going um, through the pain through uh, the enduring path that you think has reached its uh, zenith and it hasn't. There's further behind it. There's something behind it. And that's the way, pretty much the way I live now. So because of that, at a young age, um, I was goal-oriented and I was big picture-minded. Mm -hmm. Now, so going up through your amateur career, you had entered into the, uh, into the 88 Olympic yeah. trials. You, uh, so they, I know they break them down into regions first, so you were in the Western Trials, and that's what I was going to ask you, mm -hmm. when, when I saw the video of you fighting, um, it listed you as being from Puyallup, Washington, yeah. um, home of Davy Armstrong, Leo Randolph, and so that was one of the paths you took to kind of further your career, is leave San Diego and, and live up there for a bit? That was the start of where we termed my book, Answer the Bell, where I had, you know, um, I needed to take it to the next level. And the names that you just said, interestingly, when I was eight, nine years old, I would go to Las Vegas. And my coach, Robert Coons, would have me. He'd say, go up and say hi and, and, and look at this individual. Watch what he's doing. Um, Davey Armstrong, Chuck Robinson, um, Johnny Bumpus, Rocky Lockridge, um, you know, uh, Robert Shannon, um, all these box, Brett Summers. I mean, I could go on forever with, with these names. Of, of, and I would go watch it. And not only that, I get the opportunity to talk to Joe Cloud, Tom Mustin, and, and, and all these individuals and, and literally bug them bugged them but they were so nice to me and they they would take their time and you would think I was on their team you know as a little boy and I still have autographs from them when you know when I was a kid and I'd go up I get autographs to these different individuals coaches and whatever so now I had I got to a level where I needed to go to the next level and that's why I moved there um, with uh, $99 to my name um, and but with a lot of faith and a lot of hope mm -hmm. and um how old were you? Worked at, I was 20 at the time. Okay. And it worked out. It was gonna. It was my last, it, in my opinion, it was my last, and my book talks about it, it was my last stop to find out about my destiny. Um, it was my, it was the time that I was really going to put my all. I went through a period in high school where I went through what I call a uh, term, an identity crisis, so to speak. And it had more to being scared of what could be and finding out. And so I chose to be someone else, um, and um, I had to find myself again. And in finding myself again, I had to go through a different path and go to um, where I took myself. And um, I was happy with the result. Yeah, I lost. Uh, I won the, the Western, um, the Western Trials. Mm -hmm. um, I would lose in the uh, Olympic Trials to the eventual world uh, champion, world amateur champion. Um, very controversial <laughs> decision, I might add. Um, but hurt, but very, very hopeful and um, excited for my future. Because what I did, I did that all in five months of total training. Because I had been away for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So. So, and then you stuck around for another couple of years before turning pro. Yes. And from what I've read, it was, it's what I've heard so many times, uh, disgruntlement with you know, the politics and the scoring. And so it was halfway towards the 92 games and you decided to turn pro. Yeah, I, I already had my, one thing about me, I already had what the way the script was going to play out um, for me. Um, when that happened in 1988, um, I got what I needed. I wanted to win, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. um, but I also got my answer as far as I belonged. I proved that I belonged. And so now it was about what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Um, 
and I couldn't stick around like with my teammates Oscar De La Hoya, Shane Mosley, Chris Bird, all these guys because they were they were younger than me. I was you know I was a little, you know I was a little older than them, so I had to get a um, a jump start on my professional career. So my goal was to amass as much as I could um, within the amateur realm, winning, garnering um, different accolades, which I did, and then after the Goodwill Games, uh, turn um, turn professional. So I just didn't say anything because if I did, um, you know. They probably would have been the goal. The deck would have been yeah, more stacked against yeah. you. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So you so did, did win the U.S. national championship at, at, in 1990. I did. And then you said, "Okay, I'm going for well, the pros." Well, well, no. I then I won 90, and then then the Goodwill Games, and, and the 90 Goodwill Games, mm -hmm. and things like that. And I won, you know, more than that. I mean, there's, there's, right. there's I mean, 89, 90. I was I did my thing. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it I, I did what I needed to do. So, you turned pro in '91. And you gradually worked your way up to, I believe, 23 and 0. Mm -hmm. um, when you got the shot at Vince Petway, mm -hmm. Petway, you mm -hmm. were a decided underdog going mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. um, people had seen him in his two fights with Gianfranco Rossi. Most people thought he deserved them the first time. Mm -hmm. and then he, you know, took matters into his own hands the second time. And then he had the devastating knockout over Simon Brown. So you were going in facing that. Um, Tell me a little bit about that fight and going into it in your mindset. Yeah, I can remember like yesterday. First off, a lot was going on in my life. Um, things, you know, I, I went through a, um, a process of life professionally um, with uh, Abel Sanchez in 1992. Um, and our union um, lasted a year. And within that year, I learned so much, so much about myself. And I, I, I always tell him and I tell anyone, I, I thank him for... I give him the most things for my professional career, my professional development. He really taught me how to be a pro, and it was fun, so much fun being around him. Um, I can't even properly uh, explain it, but he just, he has this way of getting things out of you without being this overly demanding, demonstrative individual, and, and he's fun. Um, that being said, once, that, once I got, went through that process with him, um, I, I was really starting to believe that I could do anything and I would uh, so yeah going in as a, an underdog and, and it's um, um, I wasn't seeing what everyone else was seeing I like you said I was a decided underdog and I kept saying when I watched it first off the Vincent Petway Simon Brown fight was the most one of the most brutal knockouts that I've ever seen I mean just chilling okay mm -hmm. um, and people what people don't understand I said at that time and I'd say you don't you may beat Simon Brown, but you don't knock Simon Brown. I mean, you don't even knock him down, let alone knock him out. And cool. that was cold. Knocking him out, and he was punching. Yes, out on his back. On his back, punching, okay? Um, so he went in with some really, really good momentum. And I thought that I would, um, like I said, I just thought I just had all the tools that was needed to win. It may not be, the, I always say, not the sexy beginning that people want to see this bloodbath or whatever but by the end I always say this I would be sexy and um, and I was at the end so uh, you know I start I start the process it, it's it's like it's a beginning and a middle and end process for me mm -hmm. and I don't reveal everything I find out things I analyze things I feel things you know the power and things and, and, and you got to remember something I'm not a power I was not known as a power puncher but my size, my speed, um, my strength, just all the, my range on you and things like that, that starts to become an overwhelming experience. And, and I don't think people understand, they underestimate that. They, don't under, they, they see two people and they see me smiling and nice and all these other things. And they think that, oh gosh, I just go in there and just get them in the corner. And they don't realize I want to be in the corner. I practiced in the corner. I'm effective in the corner. And there's a reason why I'm in the corner. And so... They don't understand that I've, I've, this script has been, been worked on. It's been thought about in between stoplights. And so I was ready and I, I was engaged at the time. Uh, you know, I was, so I, you don't do those type of things and, and be that focused if you weren't that ready. And I was that ready. Mm -hmm. So after this great victory, you're, you're world champion now and you went right into a unification fight mm -hmm. with, with Terry Norris, your mm -hmm. WBC counterpart. Um, tell me a little bit about 
how that process developed that, mm -hmm. that uh, before making a defense you were able to to wrangle uh, what I would assume also was good payday, maybe your best at that point, uh, right into a unification fight and then um, you know why that fight wound up the way it did. Um, well truthfully um, and I, I uh, people forget this, I started out as a middleweight as, as um, a middleweight, I, although I was a, a light middleweight as an amateur, I, w I started out as a pro as a middleweight um, and was campaigning, campaigning as a middleweight and that was the whole goal, being a middleweight and then uh, Terry Norris, after our union, um, um, Abel and I, he made, he made some comments about me um, that were not flattering and um, I immediately went down to junior middleweight so um, my whole goal, my sole goal, and my only goal was going down the junior middleweight was because of what he said and what and um, was to kind of rectify what was said to, and of course win a world title and stuff and um, the things just designed the way they were supposed to be and I was one of these guys, if you really remember something, no one was fighting Terry Norris. I mean, you could talk about Pernell Whitaker wouldn't fight him. Julio Cesar uh, Chavez wouldn't fight him. Right. You couldn't get some of the middleweight champions to fight him. Everyone was always getting, there was something that was always getting away. And I'm one of these individuals that, you know, you, the first time you said, and plus I wanted to fight you anyways. I was like, okay, kind of when and where. This is what I wanted anyways. I wanted to find out. And I'm an ultra competitive person, so I want to find out. So, um... When it came, people, some people say, oh, you should have weighed a couple defenses or whatever. Well, that's not the way I had my script playing out. I had moved down to that weight class for this reason, and um, that's the way it was aligned. So um, that was part of the script, and we, we did, and um, there was a lot of things, obviously, that um, went on more within the, the script, the story between uh, Terry Norris and I. I mean, he's the only fighter. Um, at that particular uh, time um, that I had a personal um, disdain for, I mean, real, genuine disdain, and he of me as well. Um, and I fell to many levels um, as far as things that I did that I admit that I was wrong, um, definitely wrong about. And um, I always tell people, I learned my lesson in that match, meaning I, the, the process of... Um, I think God is, as I always say, I think he's, a, he's, a, he's not only a healing God, he's also a teaching God. And um, I was taught that day, and, and God put me before um, Terry Norris, of all people, to lose to. And not only that, not even be myself against, and um, be taught a lesson, be, ex be uh, kind of exposed in a way. Um, I don't want to call it humiliating or punishing or anything like that, but just where I couldn't do anything and, and could not follow up on anything and things like things of that nature and it was it was a teaching moment and I got it pretty quickly in within the fight everyone else was all freaking out and had their all you know analogies and what what have you and and you know whatever but I was starting to get it immediately and um, of course I didn't want to lose I mean it's a person that I a person at the time who I couldn't stand but um yeah, it was it was it was a lesson, and and I learned my lesson. I was wrong for some things that I did. I'm not the one. I'm not the adjudicator. It's not right for me to. I'm not uh, worthy to judge or make comments that I normally would not make about anyone or do things that I've done that I wouldn't do to anyone because of what they said. I'm not worthy of that, and I learned my lesson. But not only that, take take it as it is. Also, I lost to a four-time world champion. Uh, uh, Boxing uh, a Ring Hall of Famer, uh, one of the, the all-time greats, and um, it's part of life and it's part of competition. Um, it's part of growing. You, you, you don't lose, you learn. Right, and part of that is sometimes just learning, I guess, is the script, as you talk about, the, the script a lot, and got rewritten. Yes, that's right. That's right. And you went with it. Yes, that's right. So after that, you had a few more fights, and you said you started out as a middleweight, so then you, uh, you, after three more fights, you moved back up to middleweight and challenged Keith Holmes for his version of the middleweight yeah. title. Um, the just weight move, the, was it a mental thing again? Was no, it skill, or it, what it, was it, going it, on in that no, fight? It's, it's, you know, it's funny. Uh, back with Abel, one of my best training camps uh, ever. Looked great in sparring, looked great in training, everything, nothing. It's one of those situations that if I fought Keith Holmes five times, Keith Holmes would Keith Holmes would win five times. And when you get in that 
area of, of life, you've got to tip your hat. And, and, and you, you know, because I play things over and over. I can tell you certain things if I, the Terry Norris fight that I can watch and things that I could have did. Mm -hmm. With the Keith Holmes fight, um, I tried. And I couldn't do. And, and, can't and, he, and, he, and I can't find those things. There's no angle in there where I can look and, and kind of uh, say, well, I could have did something. Because I was in great shape. Uh, everything was great. Training camp, no no injuries or anything. And when that happens, you just you tip your hat and you understand that styles make fights. And... Every style is not going to be the you know you know the kosher style for the individual to uh, to to take on, and um, that was definitely one. I would lose five out of five times against Keith Holmes, and I'm I'm when I say I'm okay with that, um, I, I'm okay with that. I you mean, understand much, it, and that's yeah, that's the way that's well, that's the way it is, yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's not many people that's going to be able to say that they that they can beat me. So you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and, but I'm okay with telling you. Who, that's the one thing about me. I'm going to tell you who I can beat and who I can't beat. Mm -hmm. Well, two fights later, um, you were going for, you went back down to junior middleweight, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. USBA mm -hmm. title on the line mm -hmm. uh, against Stefan Johnson. Yes. So, uh, some people might know about it. Some, some so-called boxing fans might not know about it, but uh, it turned out to be a, a fatal fight, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I did end up seeing a copy of the fight, and, I, and what I remember, and again, I had already kind of been introduced to you between beating Vince Petway and, and uh, the Terry Norris fight and your eloquence and, and uh, the, the kind of person you are that comes forth, and I remember seeing how distraught you were in the ring after that fight. You saw that he was down, he wasn't getting up, and your, your face was wrought with emotion. Um, We've seen it before with guys like Boom Boom Mancini and, and others, you know, notably some television fights, you know, Griffith many years ago in 62, I believe it was. Um, how does that change you in your words, um, Paul Vaden's words, the, the outcome of that fight, and, and you subsequently only had one fight after that and did the result of that subsequent fight against Shabbat Flores. Do you feel like um, the Stefan Johnson fight had an impact on you to that point where just wasn't uh, wasn't you anymore in the ring or, or, or time to kind of call it quits. Did that all uh, come into play, you know, with, with the out with, with Stefan Johnson passing? Yeah, it, 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 I tell people all the time, simply just creating my exit. The, the, the worst individual that this could have happened to would be me. And, and I, I, I say the worst individual just because of my compassion and, 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 you know, my love for humanity and the reasons why I box. I always tell people the reasons why I box. It's, they always say it's a hurt game and things like that. My thing is I love because it's one-on-one -on -one competition, my skill versus your skill, my style versus your style, figure out styles, adapting to styles. Um, I can beat you, uh, but I can't beat that individual, but you can beat that individual. Styles make fights. And so... Um, I love that and having to try to solve something. I love the the, the endurance um, that it takes to go to those levels that people can't even identify with. I mean, boxing has a whole different, it's a whole different air. You know, I, I hear triathletes and people talk about, you know, I respect all that, all that stuff, what they do. Boxing is a whole different air, you know, and so... Um, that's the reason why I box. And I said, I saw Mr. Muhammad Ali and what he was doing and the, uh, how crafty he was, how smart, strategic. Um, none of the things that the destruct and destroy, none of the things, I mean, now, and, I, and, and forgive me when I say this, you, when you come in the ring against me, you're, you're not leaving the ring the same. And I say that with all um, sensitivity and I say it as humble as I can. You're, you know, I... It's 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 an over it can be an overwhelming experience because I'm um, although I'm not known as that individual with the one punch uh, knockout um, ability I'm hitting you several times in, in in repetition and I'm coming back and I get stronger as the as the as the process goes and I enjoy that I enjoy that I enjoy taking people to deep waters so um, I'm the worst person this could happen to because. 
that's not the reason why I box. Everyone always said, oh, he smiles. He's too nice to be, you know, uh, uh, become a champion. He's not going to be a champion because he smiles. Like I said, all these the reasons. And like I said, I'm about competition and not being mean or anything like that. So um, the thing about it, though, is it created my exit. So I, my career as a boxer, in, as a boxer ended um, November 20th, 1999, when that happened, um, when he passed December 5th. Uh, 1999 I was done um, but I was also starting to lose myself is from a living standpoint as far as I'm a, I'm a, I'm a father um, you know I'm married um, I've got I have businesses I've got uh, friends and I was starting to lose myself and um, so it was taking me it took boxing to get me back to where um, I needed to be the fight with Shibata Flores had nothing nothing to do with boxing. Um, I don't even think of it as a, as a boxing affair. It was a living, um, a, a, it was a, um, a revival, basically, to see if I was going to live again. Um, because everybody in my life important was starting to leave me. I um, the previous before that January third, nineteen ninety nine, I would lose my cousin to suicide. I would lose his father, my uncle, uh, August 9th to suicide, and then I had this fight. So back to back to back, um, horrific um, episodes. And, and so now it's like, why not me? I was scared to run. I was I was calling my doctor all the time. I was scared. And so everything was in the state of hypochondria. And um, when you live like that, um, you're not really living and you're kind of existing. And, and um, I'm not used to that because I'm that individual who is always out there crafting and going through the trenches of creating what I term thriller in everything I do. So I wasn't doing that. And, and, and the most important, most importantly, um, it was hard for me to even be a father to my son. So um, I was paralyzed and scared so I came back to kind of go to see if I was going to live or die if I was going to die I might as well let it happen now you know let me let me find out it's like I was um, stalling the process and so I found out my answer I wasn't going to do anything from the the Shibata Flores fight had I won or anything like that it meant it, meant it was all about living and I found out my answer when I heard the 12th and final round when I heard the bell when the bell rang and I was still alive and it basically got me back at one to where I needed to go and where I needed to be and what I needed to do and what I could do because I knew now that I was going to be alive at least um, the guilt that I was feeling for what had transpired I put so much on myself and I thought there was a sign I thought there was a sign about all these deaths that were happening to me. And now the guy who was known as the too nice with, with no killer instinct, he's involved in a situation where someone dies, you know, a, you know, in a fight. Um, it's just a lie. It's pretty, uh, you know, it's overwhelming. It was overwhelming. And um, um, you don't forget it, but I, I've grown from it. And um, back to the script again, um, the script is, is um, I don't want to say I've overcome it, but I've definitely built on it. And I'm stronger from it, and God picked the right person to have to star in this to star in this film. Definitely picked the right person. Now, when you started boxing and throughout your boxing career, you've talked about you know before we started this interview formally that you know you're always thinking, always got things going on, multitasking. Um, when was your plan for life after boxing and for a career after boxing or what you were going to do formulated? Was it, did you start thinking in advance? Did you have some of this already going on with, you know, your, your speaking and things like that? Or was it like a blank slate after you retired professionally from boxing and started from scratch there? How was all that formulated? I, it's interesting because I, I, I used to actually get criticized for by a lot of the uh, pundits um, because I was always forward thinking about other things. Like, you know, they said, oh, he's not focused because he's thinking about 
this and he thinks he's this individual and he's thinking you know he should just be thinking about boxing and he should be you know and I found it very interesting that that people hail Tiger Woods or or other athletes Michael Jordan in, in high esteem or in high regard Barry at um, when they're doing other things and, and they have other things oh that's smart he's you know thinking about the future but then for a guy like myself who's thinking about the future and not only that I have no control over it. my mind is constantly exercising in different paths that's that's just the way I'm built and it's because of boxing boxing has given me such a level of a swag such a level of confidence that I wake up whenever I go to sleep because I don't sleep because I'm so jubilant about what I'm doing and what's going in my exercising in my brain I mean, if you knew what was going on in my mind constantly, I have it's it's multitasking all the time. So I may be thinking about a fight and a strategy for a fight, but then I've got this other plan about this plot, about this patent, about it could be so many things, or this thought as far as in a speech, or there's just so many things that are exercising in my mind, and it's just strengthening it. So I I was thinking about that when I started to find out that I belonged, and in, in um. As far as an amateur, I was thinking about, okay, what I was going to do. And it wasn't like what I was going to do. It was, I was just letting myself be led in the path and abiding in that light where I was, meaning that I was, I, I didn't go away from it. So I would, I would stay there and I would exercise in that moment. And then I'd come back to it, whatever it was, whatever it is. It could be um, as far as re, uh, reading up on current events, knowing it. I'm, I'm always big on knowing things. I have to know. I have to know dates. Um, and I have to just know what I'm talking about. And what I don't know, please believe me, I will ask you because I don't know, but I want to know. And so I really want to know. I'm, and so, um, and people, people start to come into my life that I just saw, I just saw how they were able to, once again, I keep using this word, exercise their way through certain paths. They may have been an athlete and they were able to move into another level of corporate America and they were friends of mine and they would take the time. I would watch certain other athletes, you know, that um, that I respect as a kid. I had the opportunity when I was little, Dave Winfield was an individual who would come down uh, to the YMCA and he would talk to the kids and I was amongst those kids and I always say this. It was about a you know fifty to hundred kids, and he would get free tickets to you know his Winfield Pavilion when he played for the Padres here. But it was like I was the only person in there that he was talking to, because you got to remember at that age, eight, nine, ten years old, I wanted what he had. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was his champion. He had this charisma about him. He had this shine. He still does, and um, I wanted that. So it was like he was just talking to me. But I was taking in those other kids. May have just saw themselves as getting tickets. I wanted the ticket to get to that place where he was. So you've talked about corporate mentoring, uh, corporate mentorship, and uh, motivational speaking. So tell me a little bit about um, your audience with, with the speaking, you know, kids, adults, and, and some of the differences uh, and, and some of the different uh, yeah. things that you're doing right now. Yeah, it, my, my life, you know, it's interesting. It, 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 it kind of it's kind of created itself. It's like that... Um, that term like passive income, it, it's, uh, it just happens. And because I've, I've gone through these uh, episodes, there are things that people need to hear. Um, everyone has something that they're enduring. And, you know, I always say this, and I'm not being flippant, the person who thinks they have it all, and I say thinks they have it all or don't need it, they don't need me. They don't need to hear me because they have it all. They have it all together. I'm of the belief that I'm always a couple of rounds behind. I live like I'm always behind, meaning I'm a round or two, and I need to I need to win those championship rounds, critical rounds. So um, people want to hear that. Companies want to hear that. Organizations want to hear that. Kids need to hear that. Um, you know, and, I, and and it's tailored to whomever. Like I said, no one's immune. My theme is answer the bell. My book is answer the bell. My life answer the bell is my man in the mirror, uh, basically. And um, no one's immune having to or not to answer the bell. You've got a, you know, you've got a choice. And, you know, and so pretty much I talk about my life. I talk about where I was led. I would talk about where I was been, uh, where I've been. And I talk to where I am and I talk about where I'm going. But I also make it relative to the individuals about what they're doing and what they're enduring. 
and um, how they can grow and how they continue to grow. The continuum is always important to me because I don't think you ever get to a level, you should get to a level and think, oh God, I made it. I think you should, it, you basically should exalt and, and be happy and go, okay, we've had our round in between round rest. Now let's look at this. And then you get there and you, you start digging and grinding for that. And then you got to go there. It may, and you say, well, after this, I'm done. I, I, once I get here, you can say that to yourself, get there. Then you go, you know what, let me see if I can get here. And that's people, companies, uh, you know, uh, corporations, uh, CEOs and people, they all want to hear this. And, and mind you, they're talking to a person who's a champion. So I've, I've had to dig deep. I've had to reach. I've had to grind. I've had to come from behind. I've had to, you know, uh, withstand certain things that, that the normal person and doesn't. People want to hear that. And so um, I'm just being led. And um, it's been a blessing that people um, all over the world, I mean, that basically want to talk to me via phone, via Google Hangout, but want to hear the recipes and the ideas and what my mindset. I've got this going on with my, my company. I've got this going on right here and this friction here or there. What would you do, champ, in this situation? To be able to have a voice at the table, to be able to have a say-so in situational um, um, circumstances, I'm very blessed, and I, I'm very. I feel I, I I don't take it lightly. So that's what's happening with me, and along with you know, um, corporate mentoring and and everything else. I the level now that I'm at, and the level that I that I want to as far as the growth. Notice you, you said was I. Uh, it's now about what. It's not about what I can do. Now it's what I can't do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what I can't do. There's there's things, are, and I'm going to keep working to try to get to that point. But it's like what I can't do because I'll take it on. I'll try. And so I'll you're not accepting that you can't do it. Oh, yeah. I can't until I find out. But I'm also not going to be foolish either and tell you if you say, uh, you know, if you ask me first off to swim, I'm in trouble. But if I... <laughs> Okay, we've learned that. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Don't mean if I always say if I fall in the water, don't ask me any questions, come get me. But no, seriously, um, um it's about what I can't do now. What can he do? What can't he do? Well, we know that one of the things that is what you can do is write a book. So okay. you 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 came out with the book in in twenty thirteen. Mm -hmm. Was that a 13-year process? Uh, when did the idea of, of, of writing Answer the Bell, inventing your life as a champion, come into your mind? And, and, and then how long did it take to come to fruition in 2013? It's a good question. Uh, I would say probably 2009-ish or something there. I, I really... Had something to say. <laughs> I had something to say. Um, beyond what you were already beyond saying. Beyond what I was every saying. And yeah. I was, rooms and the kids. Exactly. I, I, I had something to say. And it was it's finally time to put. There were some things in life that um, I didn't talk about. I had not talked about. Um, you know, the situation with the, you know, the Terry Norris. I, I thought it was important to finally give my voice because everyone else had their own opinion or, or their own thought on what had went down and now you got to hear it from me um, and, and, and so it was important for me to talk about what I was um, going through with the Stefan Johnson it, 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 my beginning how I felt as, as a child going growing up and, and you know in, in my thoughts my the identity crisis that I went through so um, I, it was time to talk about this and, and, and get to these. And, and it was a couple of things. It was uh, a wide range of emotions because um, it was there was periods where it was, they're obviously sad. Um, there was unbelievably uh, great uh, um, feelings going through the journey, going back, reaching back to it. Um, and, you know, there was parts that were funny um, and, and very triumphant. So... Um, was I wasn't ready to go there in certain places. There were certain places I, you know, talking about my father's, um, you know, when my father passed and going back to that place, talking about, um, you know, like I said, Stefan, my, the cousin, my cousin and my uncle, um, going through the process, being engaged and going back to that place again, um, my son being born. Um, so was I ready for, I wasn't ready until then. And, and I wanted to express it in the proper way. And, um, I was, I was ready and it was, it was, a. Uh, 
it was a, a, a therapeutic uh, um, um, experience for me. It was, uh, I'm and I'm glad I did it. Um, and it was very honest too. That's the one thing I wanted to be honest about. It. I didn't want to kind of hold back what I felt. I wanted to talk about what I didn't like. I wanted to talk about. I didn't want to say oh, I'm not going to say that because. You know, that's going to hurt so-and-so's feelings. So I had to get to that place where I could talk about that. And there's other things as far as my future um, developments, um, because like I said, it doesn't stop, um, where I will be doing some other offerings and, and, and where, like I said, when I get to a place where I'm ready to express certain things, um, um, but at the right time. Just some like, other literary offerings, is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not finished. I was going to ask yeah, you, is oh, there yeah. another book? Yeah, we've like we got a couple. The, 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 the cool thing about it is when you go through a process like that and you find another niche and um, it, you want to grow from and you want to go to the next place, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's uh, um, some areas that I definitely want to delve into um, as far as uh, um, my next... Uh, my next offering is from a book form, and uh, my, 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 the only thing that stopped me is my, there's other things going on with the corporate mentoring and, and, and speaking and stuff, and, and you've got to really kind of go, the things that I want to do next, you really got to go away again and, and do the proper um, research and go and um, go back into that, like I said, that, that well of inventory and, and, and find those pieces and, and, um, and remember the time. So you're not really stopped. It's just temporarily postponed. Yeah, okay. temporary. I'm always. That's always. Yeah, yeah. I'm because, but, I, but, but I'm also doing other things. So it's it's because the reasons why is because I'm doing other things. But every now and then I'll chip and I'll I'll, I'll write something down. I have so many things that I mean I I write down and stuff that I that there'll be a time and place where we make usage of making it a I always say a nice song. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, when when you and I first got in touch, you said um, Fight News is you know, the source that you go to. So yes. uh, you did a boxing workout this morning. So do you? I'm assuming it's safe to say you still follow the game to a certain point. I do, I do. I I, I love boxing. You know, I, I it's funny. I always have conversations with people, and they always they always say, "Oh, boxing." It's interesting when you, when you're away from a sport, and you, the more you go. I want to say, I mean, I thought I was very blessed as a boxer, but the fur, the more away, the better you you are to people. They kind of, they so it wasn't as great as boxing is not as great as when when your time when you were boxing, whatever. And I have this answer that always, I mean, there'll never be another Muhammad Ali. I always say, never. Okay, there's no one like Muhammad Ali. Um, I'll be honest with you, Sugar Ray Leonard. I've never, I haven't seen anyone like Sugar Ray Leonard. Okay. Um, there's so much talent out there, and it, it's it's talent is is never ending. Um, these they're younger, they're faster. That you know, there's so much to you know. There's so many things now that the offerings. It, talent doesn't you know it, it doesn't it's there. And, and I watch these boxers box, and, and they're they're good boxers, and I'm I'm excited to see it and keep keep up with them what they're doing. So. Um, the boxing game is fine. The boxing game is not going anywhere. Um, you're right. Yes, I do. Um, Fight News has been um, an institution that I definitely go to and I look for as far as news. I love breaking news. I love reading up and keeping up on you know the people that I, that I like to follow. Um, and and it's it's something that that I trust. You know, I just, sometimes you go to something you go, you don't know if you're going to get the right message behind this or if there's a uh, there's something behind it if there's an agenda. A agenda behind it which we know can can be so um, but I know fight news it's gonna get it's gonna be fresh it's gonna be a, a, a nice offering and it's gonna be a, a splendid read on whatever it is be it news be it results be it a, a story on something so uh, and they're you know very up-to-date on things even you know unfortunate things you know passings and things like that um, so fight news has been something that I've been following um, well since it's, uh, since I've been on uh, on, on the internet so uh, good to hear uh, so in closing um, or one of the last things at least about boxing um, so you had your own style you following some of the guys today are you drawn or you said some guys you pay attention to guys that are you know fighting in the same vein you did or do, or do you like a variety of different styles who are some of the guys you like right now, right now um, I like uh, what's the kid's name uh, he's a 140 pounder 
Oh gosh, I'll get it. Uh, Crawford, Terrence, oh, Terrence Crawford. Crawford. I was okay. yeah. I was, and the reason why, reason why, I had to stop because I always talk and I, and I always sometimes I end up calling him Terrence Howard. So that's why that's oh, why that. Okay. So I go, God, I like he's I like him. Uh, uh, Chocolate. Uh, Chocolatito. Yes, good fighter. Uh-huh. Um, uh, Triple Triple G, Andre Ward. I mean Andre Ward. Um, who else? I like Andre Ward. Like Triple G. Um, I like um the kid um uh, Canelo. Okay. Uh, and from your good, weight class. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Canelo's a good fighter. I like yeah. Canelo. Um, there's I mean there's 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 a wide range of, of good fighters. And, you know you got the up and coming individuals um, as well. I mean so. As far as my style and things like that, I don't necessarily, um, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't look for a person say, I've never looked at someone and said, you know what, that guy reminds me of, of me. Uh, um, you know, I think the style, that I, I think my style became what it became. I mean, think about it. My two favorite boxers, Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard, and I was able to put just the mindset as far as whatever. I may not have done the same things, but I was able to kind of create my own stage setting um, of what and, and, and grow from what being able to watch them allowed me to be alert and, and to be focused and to understand the that, the that it was just not about being in the ring. There was a whole stage, especially... Well, both of them actually, but just because Leonard, uh, as he as he went on, the focus level was very important to him. And um, if you watch Sugar Ray Leonard, if, if you really watch Sugar Ray Leonard, I, and I still watch Sugar Ray Leonard. I mean, I still watch his fights. Watch him when uh, when he like s- hurts an opponent before the bell rings, or he'll he'll size the individual up. He always watched as the, as you go through the fourth fifth round. He'd watch the individual walk back to the corner. He doesn't just, you know, so everything is important to him. So it's not like the bell rings and he walks back to his corner. He would size the person back, see if the equilibrium was off, see if they were starting to get tired, see if they were still hurt, and to see how he was going to go in, in, in the next stanza, how he was going to take it on. That's, that's to me, that's a, uh, that's a perfect conductor. That's a perfect uh, individual as far as the engineer uh, winning. And that's what I'm talking about, and that's what I talk about. Is engineering the process to wing. That's what I'm doing today. All I'm doing today is what I've done all my life, pretty much, and that is finding ways to engineer the process to winning in the ring and outside the ring. So I just happen to still live in the mindset of the way I live in the ring um, and, and basically preaching um, or um, conveying to people uh, the recipes and what the realms of what they do. Oh, Paul, this has been fascinating listening to you tell your story, uh, where you came from, where you are now, and where you're headed. Um, lastly, to p- former Paul Vaden fans who wondered what would have happened to you, what would you like to say to them? I'm, <laughs> I feel like I've, I'm, I just turned 48 and I feel like I've just begun. There's so many mother, many offerings that are on the table that are going to be happening for me. You can reach me at, uh, you know, on either on Facebook, Paul Vaden. You can reach me on Twitter at Answer the Bell. Uh, you can reach me on Instagram, Paul underscore Vaden. I mean, there's just so many areas, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm just beginning to get things. And that's a scary thing in a positive sense. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.